Hi friends, Jen here with Serenity Hill Farmstead. So what we're gonna talk about today is asthma and breathing issues. If you or someone you love uh, has breathing issues, you know this is the most terrifying thing that you can deal with on a regular basis. It can come out of nowhere. You can have lots of advance warning and see your triggers coming and know how to deal with it um, as it's coming or it can just hit you out of nowhere and it is a dire emergency. So I'm gonna talk about some of the things we do. We are a family of people with asthma. I have severe asthma. I've got another child that has moderate asthma and one that is just kind of seasonal. So I'm gonna to talk to you about what we do both as a preventative and supportive kind of measure with herbs and how we deal with emergency situations. So let's get into it. So first as preventatives, I wanna to talk to you about the herbs that we use. Mullen is by far the best preventative herbal uh, respiratory supportive herb that you can take. You can drink this as a warm tea. It's actually best taken as a warm tea. You're looking for mullein leaf here. You don't really wanna ingest the flower. The root is specifically for lower inflammatory back pain. So you want to go after the leaf, the nice fuzzy green leaf. You can take them fresh, you can take them dried, and you can consume that tea as warm as possible. This is a tea that works best when it's drank warm. You're not trying to hurt yourself, don't burn yourself or anything, but drink it as warm as possible. If it's a kid that doesn't really like tea, you can do this as an inhalation. So you can put the mullein in a hot, like boiling water, then take it off, put it in a big bowl, put the mullein in there and then put a big towel over your child or you, you know, whoever wants to do this, over your head and over the bowl so everything is covered and you're breathing it in. So you need to have Kleenex or a handkerchief or something uh, on hand in there with you because it's, it, things are gonna drain, things are gonna happen. But you wanna breathe in all of those vapors because herbal properties come through in the steam also. So you want to make sure you're getting that in. Even when I'm drinking my mullein tea, I make sure that I'm sitting here and breathing in the steam as I'm drinking also because it's super beneficial. So, so mullein is my top herb to use on a daily basis as a good respiratory tonic. When we are having issues, and now it depends on what issue you're having. If you are having an issue with your asthma where you have more dryness in there, uh, where you've got that dry, irritated cough and it's just so much inflammation, and but everything is dry, you're not having that, you know, all those secretions and all that mucus, you wanna look at marshmallow, the aerial parts of marshmallow. Marshmallow has that mucilage in it, uh, the root is more for the gastrointestinal tract. You can absolutely use it and it'll benefit in your respiratory tract. But if you want something that's just like a go-to tea blend, marshmallow, leaf, flower, stem, all of those you can use in a tea. So what that plant does is it helps to balance the mucilage. So if you have all of that dryness, it causes more inflammation and that will help balance that so it can help support uh, healthy mucous membranes on the insides of your airways and your nose, the sinuses, your throat, your mouth, everything. Excuse the train, it's going by. So the other herb that you're going to pair with that is stinging nettle. Stinging nettle is tremendous for lowering inflammation. I add stinging nettle into virtually every tea I drink just because of my systemic uh, inflammation and the inflammatory response I have with my asthma. It is incredibly important to lower that inflammation. I would argue that stinging nettle is important for all asthmatics because we all deal with that inflammation in our upper respiratory, in our airway, and down throughout our lungs. I think stinging nettle should absolutely be added there. It is also specifically talked about helping with asthma. So not just in the anti-inflammatory properties, but also for all types of asthmatics. If you have the type of asthma that has the opposite effect and has a lot of mucus and just a lot of secretions that are just kind of like flying around in there, then you wanna look at something that is an expectorant like hyssop and elecampane. I use both of these. I use hyssop in my tea and elecampane as a tincture. Now this elecampane tincture works like that. It is so fast and it helps just kind of break everything apart so you can get it up. Hyssop is a little bit kind of a longer game where it takes a little bit longer. You can absolutely use it as an inhalant in that breathe tea blend. Um, I will put in marshmallow in there. I'll put in the hyssop. I'll put in the mullein and you can just throw all of that in there and breathe all of that in the nettle too. Breathe all of that in. It helps get that in. Breathe it in. Drink it up. All of those are going to be helpful there. Uh, the big one with the Ella campaign is that it is a root and you are not going to unlock the properties if you just stick it in a tea. So you either need to do that as a decoction or put it in a tincture. The preferred way for that is in a tincture. It just 
unlocks everything the best and it gives you all of the properties from the herb um, in a more potent way. So Ella Campaign is probably my go-to. I have a respiratory blend that has Ella Campaign, Goldenrod, uh, because I've got some allergy, allergic asthma things happening there, and nettle. Those three things make my favorite go-to respiratory tincture blend. Uh, that one has been the most helpful for me. Now, let's talk about some of the equipment that you should have on hand and how to use these things. Now, I, because we do have asthma, like I said, I've got like, you know, the good medical grade stuff. You can get different kinds of things. You can get some stuff on Amazon. You can go to a medical supply store and buy this without a prescription. You don't need it. Um, it just depends on the store and it depends on kind of how they, they run things. There's some medical supply stores that like you have to have your doctor's order before they'll give them to you. Some you can just walk in and go, hi, I have a nebulizer, it broke. I can't get into the doctor and I need this now. And they'll be like, okay, here you go. But you have to pay out of pocket for it without a prescription. So this is a nebulizer. This plugs in, standard plug, uh, and then you get one of these. The medication goes into here. Medication vials look like this. You bust off the top, you squeeze it in there, keep it in there, because it like, you know, will spray up at you and you will lose your medication. And sometimes they'll spray from the side. So I put this like way down in there when I squeeze it in. And then you toss that one time use, you screw this on, make sure you keep everything upright, even during your treatment. If you turn it, it will spill out. Make sure you keep everything upright during your treatment. So treatments can take anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes, depending on your nebulizer, mine take about 15. Uh, and your medication that you are gonna use in there is a prescribed albuterol medication. So I use ibuprofen bromide because that one is albuterol and a steroid together. It's called a duoneb. That's what I use for me because I have severe asthma. My kids that do not have super severe asthma, they just use regular albuterol sulfate. You have to get these medications with a prescription from your doctor. But if you want to have things like this, like a breathing treatment on hand, and you cannot get those prescriptions, you can get sterile saline. It is incredibly important that you get the right thing. This is going into your airway. Please do not use contact solution. That is not the same. Please don't do that. Things you see on TikTok. Um, <laughs> you have to get them like this. This is sterile. This is a sterile container. Inside the contents are sterile. You want this to put into your breathing treatment to breathe into your lungs. You don't want anything else. Please don't go to Walmart and just get something that you squeeze out of a bottle. You need these thingies, okay? Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is knowing what you're listening to. Get yourself a, yourself a stethoscope. It does not need to be a fancy one, this is a fancy one. Don't get yourself a super fancy one. You don't need to spend 200 plus dollars on a stethoscope. You can get them for 20 bucks off of Amazon or from Walmart or Walgreens or whatever. And then you're gonna go onto YouTube and you're going to listen to breath sounds. You need to listen to what clear lungs sound like. You need to listen to what wheezing lungs sound like. If you have children, you need to listen to what strider sounds like. The difference between wheezing and strider is wheezing is that whistle that is coming. It's kind of like a whistle. They call it a whistle. It doesn't, it doesn't really sound like a whistle. It's kind of whistly, <laughs> high pitched. And when you breathe out and you hear that sound, that's wheezing. When you are breathing in and you hear that sound, that's strider. And both are medical emergencies. The very important thing for you to remember with children with breathing emergencies is you need to get them to the emergency room now. You don't play around and wait and see what's gonna happen. You don't go, well, let's see if I can get them comfortable enough to sleep and see how they are in the morning. In all of my years as a paramedic, the reason that kids stop breathing is because their parents wait and see. If your child is making noises when they breathe, or if they are retracting, where they are breathing in and they're using what they call the intercostal muscles, where you can see their ribs as they're breathing in, or their neck muscle, their neck is doing this, okay? That's retracting. That is an emergency. And kids can go from looking okay to not breathing like that. It's called decompensation. And it is scary and it is fast. And especially if you live far away from a hospital, you don't wanna play with that. So if you have a kid that is having breathing issues, now I'm gonna stress this next part. If 
there is no emergency room around. Like there is no emergency room. You're in the middle of nowhere and it's not an option. There is no 911 and you have no other options. There's a couple options to open the airway super fast. That is drinking strong, strong black coffee. There are some bronchodilator properties in, in coffee that can help. Um, you have to drink it hot, you have to drink it fast, um, and it can work. It can also not, it, it really just depends on the person. It can help relieve the issue. The very first thing you have to look at though, before you do this, I should have mentioned this first, is that you have to look at what's triggering the attack. If it is an allergen, you need to move them from that allergen immediately. And not just, oh, well, the person that's smoking is in the other room. No, out, out of that house, get them away. If it's cold air, get them to where it's warm and moist. If it's hot air, get them to where it's cold and dry. If you do have allergic asthma, you should also always keep on hand Benadryl and an EpiPen if you are to the point where you need an inhaler or something like that uh, to help lower that inflammation to get you air. Because the thing about allergies is the more you are exposed to them, the more severe your reaction will get over time. It's not an if, it's not a possibility, it's a will. So if you are allergic to shellfish and you have it occasionally, at some point in time, you are gonna have a massive severe allergic reaction. So you don't want to have yourself in that situation. First off, keep yourself away from the things that trigger you. Second, make sure you have the emergency medications on hand. Now in an emergency allergic situation, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do with herbs. You need Benadryl, you need epinephrine, you need to open everything up fast in what we call an anaphylactic response, which is where all of your airways just shuts. It just like clamps down and you can't get air. In that kind of situation, people die from that really fast. So you have to have those kinds of medications on hand in order to save somebody in anaphylactic shock most of the time. As far as herbs go, if you have consumed something or you're around something that you are allergic to and you know it's gonna cause like hives and some swelling in your airway, there are some things that you can take immediately that can help um, to kind of lower that inflammation. Again, first things first, take your Benadryl, take your allergy medication first. You wanna get yourself out of the dire emergency with the pharmaceutical stuff, and then you support yourself with herbs. That's how we balance allopathy and herbalism. When it comes to allergic asthma in this case, goldenrod and nettle are my big go-tos. Those are the big ones that can help with indoor, goldenrod can help with indoor allergies, can help with cat allergies, can help with hay fever, can help with ragweed uh, allergies. And then nettle, of course, we've talked about with the massive anti-inflammatory uh, properties that it holds. So having that on hand as a tincture is incredibly helpful. Okay, so one other tool I want to talk about is this. This here is a peak flow meter and you don't have to have a prescription for this. You can just get one off of Amazon. Um, these help measure basically what your lungs are capable of doing, like the capacity of your lungs, how healthy they are. So I'm gonna show you how to do this. You take a big deep breath, breath in and you forcefully exhale. And this will show you exactly where you're at. So I am actually above, that's awesome. I am above my, um, my top. Like this is my ideal range. I am just a hair above it. Now, actually we don't go with the first one. We do the second one. I'm right, right just, just a hair above it again. So that's awesome. My peak flow, my lung capacity is fabulous right now. I am in a very good spot. When I am sick with a respiratory condition, I am usually somewhere in the middle. If I start creeping down, I need steroids. I need steroids like yesterday, okay? So this is a good indicator for me of what I need to do to balance uh, my lung health. So... Um, if it's something herbal I need to do, if it's time to intervene with steroids and medication, then there's that. But we're going to add that too. Steroids is something else that I always, always, always have on hand. And it's the reason I have that, I kind of have a standing order with my doctors, um, rheumatologist and my primary do doctor. Uh, we had long conversations about, hey, I know when I need a steroid. This is how I know I need a steroid. I had to convince them that I know what I'm doing. And then they were like, okay, you do know. The reason I wanted to have a kind of on hand 
steroid prescription, like always have that on hand, is because my doctors are not always available. It is not easy to get a hold of them like ever. And just going to get a steroid is not something that I need to go to an emergency room for. Because if I'm going to an emergency room, I'm putting myself at risk for getting something else respiratory, especially this time of year, or I am, um, I'm, I'm basically just going to be setting myself up for a whole bunch of expensive, unnecessary tests when I know all I need is a steroid. So having that conversation with your doctor, if this is a similar situation for you, where you say, hey, look, I have asthma and I know when I need a steroid and you prove to them that you know how to manage yourself. And you'd be surprised that a lot of doctors are willing to give you the power to kind of manage your own uh, chronic situation. The last piece of equipment that I'm gonna talk about that you should have, whether you have asthma or any other kind of breathing condition or not, is a pulse oximeter. A pulse oximeter, I really don't know where mine went, is this little thing that goes on your finger. It's battery operated and it checks your pulse and it checks your oxygen saturation level. That is very important to know, okay? If you are having shortness of breath, uh, if you're having asthma issues, if you have the flu or if you have COVID or if you have a kid with croup, um, or some like bronchitis, you need to be checking and maintaining your good oxygenation. A good oxygenation is from 95 to 100. If you get under 95, things are kind of like, okay, that's the gray area. You really want to get them up. You don't want to be there for too long, but it's not super dangerous yet. Under 90 is when it's dangerous. Under 90% means you don't have adequate perfusion. You are not going to be getting that good gas exchange to support the cells in your body and optimum brain function and respiratory function and just like basic, you know, life sustaining things. But there are some things you need to know about how to use a pulse oximeter. If you have nail polish on, it's not gonna work as well. Take your nail polish off, especially if it's glittery, if it's got any kind of um, like, you know, those gel things and everything where it's got like a good hard layer to it. You don't want that. Acrylic nails, fake nails, take them off. Please take them off. It's not going to give you a good reading. If you have really cold hands, that can affect your reading also. Um, if you are not getting a good reading on your hands, if you don't have hands, put them on your toes. They work fine on your toes too. As a last ditch effort, you can put it on your ear. This is something that do, they do for kids all of the time. So that's another option also. You just pretty much need a little bit of, you know, something <laughs> to stick that on uh, so that you can get a good reading. It needs to fit within the, um, the confines of the pulse ox. It can't be like spilling out over. So you can use like your earlobe or something like that in a last ditch effort. Not the most reliable thing, but you can do it. I am also just gonna kind of throw this out there as a suggestion. If you do have issues with your breathing, uh, you really should have, it's a really good investment to get a smartwatch. So we have Apple watches and because, I mean, we just were an Apple family. So uh, we like Apple watches. I have mine, it's been dead for like a week. I need to charge it. <laughs> but we have them because um, measuring pulse ox, especially in my sleep and when I'm flaring is incredibly important and I can keep all of that in a file and I can send it to my doctor so they can see what's happening with me. And those are actually, I, I can't speak for the Android ones, but I know the Apple Watch is incredibly reliable as long as it is on you correctly. So it has to be pretty firm on there. It doesn't have to be so tight that it's like squeezing your hand, but it has to be pretty firm on there and you have to keep your watch clean. Please clean them, just clean them. Just put a little vinegar on a Q-tip and just go in there and clean them. If they're not clean, you're not gonna get a good, reliable, clear reading. If you keep them clean and you keep them charged and you keep the updates done, you have to keep your, phone, your watch updated, then you have a good, reliable pulse ox with you at all times. So I love that, that has been, that's been a kind of a game changer for me because I am constantly needing to keep an eye on my, my oxygenation. So there we have it all about how I handle asthma, both allopathically and with herbs. Herbs have been the turning point for me. I do have a steroid inhaler. It's called a maintenance inhaler. I do have that one. I do have my rescue inhaler. I've got my nebulizer. I've got all of my equipment. And that definitely is necessary for me. I have to have that. But having herbalism is what has been the turning point for me for my asthma. It helps me get rid of having air hunger after COVID. It helped, uh, it really helps with 
you know, getting that expectorant property of getting everything up and out and clearing my lungs. It helps me lower my inflammation. It's really been the turning point for me. And I do have to take this on a daily, regular basis. And, you know, if I'm starting to flare, then multiple times a day. But I also have to take my pharmaceutical medication multiple times a day. And I would rather have this. I'd rather take a tincture and a cup of tea than take a steroid that is going to give me all sorts of other nasty side effects. It's going to affect, it's just so many things. I, I want to stay off the steroids if at all possible. Um, and I want to stay off the medications that give me palpitations and make me super jittery if I can help it. Now in an emergency situation, again, I'm going to stress again, I reach for, for this stuff. Okay, this is what I take because that is an emergency situation, but I can prevent myself from getting there by doing the herb stuff. So definitely if you have asthma, look into this, consider some of these herbs we talked about today. If you wanna learn more about herbs, I'd love to have you subscribe to my channel. I also have an awesome website that has all sorts of information. I've got an herbal recipe book with all sorts of preparations that you can dive into. There's some good respiratory stuff in there too. If you're interested in that, definitely go check the uh, description box and click the link down there. It'll take you straight to it. If you enjoyed this today, I'd love to have you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you can stay up to date with everything we put out and you can hear the next herbal emergency thingy that I'm gonna talk about. Not quite sure what it's gonna be yet. Thanks for hanging out today. We'll see you in the next one. Bye.